tell us what is Invesco QQQ? And I think after that long music intro, everybody is on bated breath. <laughs> they first, can't wait. What is first it? First question. <laughs> um, so uh, Invesco QQQ, besides what you see in, in, in the commercials every five minutes on, on most financial networks, um, is we like to joke that it's on the Mount Rushmore of ETFs. So it's, it's the fifth largest ETF listed. It's the second most actively traded fund in the world. Uh, and it tracks the NASDAQ 100 index. So it's made of, uh, of the 100 largest companies listed on the NASDAQ exchange X financials. So what you get is this portfolio of 100 of the kind of most growth leaning, very innovative, very kind of forward looking companies um, that list on, on the NASDAQ exchange. And, and, and over the past you know, 20 plus years that QQQ has, has had a live history, it's traded, um, it's really blossomed into one of the preeminent kind of ways for investors to access US large cap growth. You mentioned that QQQ is innovative. So actually, how would you define being innovative? Is there a way you quantify that? Yes, and, and I think quantifying it is, is a very important notion, right? I, I, I mean, if any of you have heard me speak over the past like six months, uh, innovation is the most overused word of 2021. That's after unprecedented in, in 2020. Um, but everybody's got the most innovative product, the most innovative strategy, the most innovative fund, um, but it's, it's purely aspirational, right? We, 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 we try to figure out a way that we can quantify why these companies seem to always be ahead of the curve. Um, and I think it starts with their commitment to research and development. So as we start to look at the companies that make up the NASDAQ 100 index, we found that historically they, they commit more to research and development spend than their peers. And by peers, I mean you know, companies in the S&P 500, companies in the Russell 1000 growth. And I, I think that commitment is an important one to note because an R&D spend in general is, is, is long term. Right? You don't throw money at an R&D project and expect that to be accretive to earnings next quarter, next year, even in some cases three years. Right? This is, this is decades long. I mean, cloud computing is a perfect example. I mean, the notion of cloud computing didn't really come about until about 2007, which is hard to believe that was 15 years ago. And just now it's starting to contribute to companies' bottom line. So the notion of R&D in general is very long term. And these companies, by, by their commitment, by spending more than their peers, um, I think have shown and fostered this culture of, of innovation and being able to stay ahead of the curve. Um, the second step or second way that we try to quantify innovation is we look at, at, at patent filings. So through our partners at NASDAQ a, 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 and a research-based kind of AI firm out of Northern California, we look at patent filings over the course of one-year periods. And over the course of, of, of May 31st, 2021 through May 31st, 2022, we found that NASDAQ 100 companies or, or companies in QQQ uh, filed over 25% of patents to, uh, around themes or disruptive technologies like big data, cloud computing, uh, cybersecurity, 3D graphics. Um, so I think that's really interesting to note because they, they're very active in, in this space of kind of themes and, and ideas that are just coming to fruition now. Right? They're just starting to, to, to kind of become a large part of our daily lives. So you know, I think it starts with R&D. I think from there you can kind of take another look under the hood and, and, and the patent side of things. But I think in general that sort of is the fuel that drives these companies to consistently stay ahead of the curve. And Ryan, what does all of this mean for investors? Well, you know, I, I think for investors that are looking for growth companies, the, these companies have shown the ability to grow. Um, over the past 10 calendar years, NASDAQ 100 companies have, have grown earnings, revenue, uh, dividends at, at faster rates than, again, those, those competitors in, in, in some of these other indices. Um, you know, beyond just the, the, the pure fundamental growth, you know, when, when you're looking at growth companies, you're, you're only as good as, 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 as fast as you can grow. Right, so we need to look at the long term as well. So I'll go back to sort of the, the, the patent notion. Right? 3D graphics, cloud computing, cybersecurity. OK, we, we see that today. Right? We see that in, when we log into our work computers. We start to see that in, in companies' earnings reports. But as you look at some of the other patents, there's things like you know, bioinformatics, quantum computing, spacecraft and satellites. And, you know, I don't know which one of these themes is going to be a, a major, major part of our daily lives, but chances are it, it's going to be one of them. So you're seeing earnings growth today. You're also seeing the avenues to, to, to where that earnings growth will be coming from 5, 10, 15 years down the line. So I think you know, that, that commitment to innovation ensures that, that, that investors are getting you know, these growth-oriented companies where they're trying to invest in growth-oriented companies. And could you leave us with one quick example of individual investors? What are you, what are you doing for them? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, it, QQQ, it, 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 we have over $150 billion in, in assets under management, right? It's, again, it's the fifth largest ETF out there. So, you know, we have a very diverse base of, of investors. We have institutional investors. We have a lot of, of investors in the financial advisor, the RIA community, and then all the way down to the individual investor. So we think like the, this notion of financial education, which was, was talked about pretty extensively in, in the first panel, is, is, is imperative. Um, and it needs to be approachable, right? You, you, you heard, it needs to be kind of digitally oriented. It needs to be approachable. They don't necessarily need kind of the white glove service. It's more of a, hey, how do I educate myself? Um, so we've developed a game called uh, How Not to Suck at Money. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think we all need that. Right, so. a, a catchy name. Um, but it's like, it is a very easy to understand. It's a very approachable, it's an interactive game. Um, and it, it's through our it's in conjunction with our, our sponsorship of the NCAA. So QQQ is the official ETF of the NCAA. How Not to Suck at Money is the official financial literacy program of the NCAA. So geared towards more college age students, it could be used for high schoolers. I've done the game. It could be useful for folks in their mid to late 30s. Um, and it takes a, an approach that it's not, this is a stock, this is a bond, this is how we invest in it, right? It's looking at real world financial examples. Hey, maybe this is what you should do with credit card debt. Um, things that were not necessarily taught in, in, in high school, in college, and beyond. And even in the investing world, right? I mean, folks know a ton about options when they're, when, when they're trading on some of these platforms. They don't really know how to effectively pay down credit card debt. So again, you can look at it at hntsam.com. Uh, and I think it's just the, the start of our commitment to the individual investor, the next generation of investors, and, and hope to continue this program for, uh, for years to come. Fantastic. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks.